and to uh, worship you uh, without fear. Uh, Lord, just pray for those that are around the world that, that do face fear and danger to honor you in worshiping you. Lord, pray for those that are not with us today and not feeling well. Pray for those that are still on their way. Bring them here safely. And as always, Lord, if there's someone here that needs Jesus as their Savior, might today be the day of their salvation. We love you and thank you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've looked at real, uh, just a real brief review. We've looked at salvation through Jesus Christ. We've looked at the fact that we're justified because of that through Christ. We've looked at the fact that we also need to, uh, as a result of that or as a response to that, live a life of sanctification. Uh, and then we also looked last week at the reality that uh, Israel, you know, God's not done with Israel. Israel's promises are still Israel's promises. And that God has set them aside for a time and is reaching out to all peoples of the world, irregardless of what nation they might become from, uh, to bring them to salvation. Uh, and then once that time is done and, and the rapture takes place, then we enter into the last uh, last period of time where God deals with the nation of Israel and brings them back to him. So we start up in chapter 12 with uh, concluding uh, Paul dealing with the question of what about Israel in light of uh, grace and in light of uh, God reaching to all peoples, not just to Jews. Uh, and when he gets back to and the, the balance of the book from 12 to 16 is practical application or, or our responsibility as Christians as being born again, justified in Christ, and we are challenged and we are commanded to live a life of sanctification, being set apart, setting apart our lives for God so that He can use us and that we can receive God's blessings uh, by living a life that lines up with our standing in Christ. And so uh, these are the, and I mentioned earlier that we have liberty. We're free from the bondage of sin. We don't have to yield to sin. We, we should yield to the Holy Spirit. But with liberty comes responsibility. And this is where the responsibility part of it is, is laid out for us in these remaining chapters. As Paul goes and touches on different areas in our lives where we have some responsibility before God, if we're going to live a life of sanctification, then these are the areas that we need to work on and focus on in our Christian walk. So let's start there in chapter 12 and verse number 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And these two verses right here kind of set the tone for the remainder of the book, because if we don't get this one right, uh, we're going to struggle to really fulfill uh, the other areas that Paul has challenged us to live uh, sanctified and set apart to God. Because right here, with these two verses right here, uh, is dealing with our responsibility to God. A in living a sanctified life, our first responsibility is to God, the one who saved us. And as we look at this real, real briefly, uh, it says we're to present. That, that's another word, of, you know, it's... Same meaning as what we learned about earlier when it, Paul says we have to yield to the Holy Spirit. We have a choice we make every day. Are we going to yield to the flesh? Are we going to give in to our desires and, and the temptations that, that the world and, and the enemy will bring our way? Uh, Satan will tempt us. Things we interact with, if, if we interact in the world and involve ourselves in the things of the world, we're going to find temptation there. And then our own wicked flesh will tempt us. Uh, to do wrong. So are we going to yield to that or are we going to yield to the Spirit? So Paul here says we're to present or to yield our bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice means, it implies action. It's going to take action to serve God, to worship God. It takes action. Uh, it's not just some, some passive thing. You don't, you, you don't just get saved and then just sit and just enjoy your blessed assurance until it's time to go to heaven. No, there's work to be done. And, and there's service to be done, and we're going to see that as we go through these chapters. But we're to be a living sacrifice. We're to be busy, involved, uh, yielding ourselves to the Lord, and, and He has things for us to do. But we have to do it God's way. We, we have to be a holy and acceptable sacrifice. Just like the Old Testament sacrifice, you couldn't just bring any old animal. It had to be an animal without spot and without blemish, uh, and it had to be perfect. It had to be pure. Uh, because it pictured Christ, who was our pure sacrifice. And in so doing, 
God expects us to worship Him in purity and serve Him in purity and to live a life that demonstrates to a lost and dying world that there were different. And there's a reason for that difference, and that reason is Jesus Christ who saved us. <clears throat> so we need to do it God's way. We need to be holy and acceptable. We're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. After all the, all the things we've covered in Romans, all the things that God has done for us, all the things that Jesus has done for us, this is not unreasonable for Him to ask that we yield to Him and serve Him. After all He's done for us, He doesn't ask anything that's unreasonable or just ridiculous. He just says, yield to me, offer your life to me as a sacrifice that I can use you to accomplish my will. And that's what that, we see that second verse. This is, this is where um, that's what he desires. That's our responsibility before God. And verse 2 is how we accomplish that. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. Conform means <clears throat> to change something from the outside with outside influence. And if we're not careful, what we choose to engage in that this world has to offer, now we, you know, we we're in the world, but the Bible says we're not to be of the world. We're here. And the fact that you woke up this morning means that God still has a plan and a purpose for you to accomplish today. You're not promised tomorrow, but today there is something God wants you to accomplish. So you're here. Otherwise, He would have taken you home to heaven. So while we're here, we are in the world, but, but we need to be careful. We need to make choices to yield to the Holy Spirit so that we're not, not influenced by what the world's philosophies are and the world's influences are. Because the world follows Satan. The lost person does not know God, does not know the things of God. They seem very weird and, and uncomfortable and unreasonable to a lost person. But the world's philosophies, the world's way of thinking is very different and opposed to what God's ways are. And we need to be careful that we're not, we don't allow the world to change the way we are through outside influences that conforming us to them. We, ha we have a responsibility to be a gospel witness, but we need to be careful that we do not become conformed by those lost people that we interact with. We're to make a difference in this lost and dying world, and we can't do that if we're not yielding to God, because if we're not yielding to the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen is they will conform us. But the Bible says, instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there's the key. The battle is in the mind. God wants us to think the way God thinks. It's very easy for us to get wrapped up in the hustle and bustle of life and, and to kind of lose sight of the fact that we are fighting a spiritual battle. We get caught up in the temporal things, the things that we see, the problems we experience, the challenges we face, and, and we interact and everything. We, it's, it's just natural for us to just deal with the temporal because that's what we see. But as we spend time with the Lord and we yield to the Holy Spirit and we seek His working in our life, God will begin to transform us. And that's a change from the inside out. The world wants to change you from the outside in. God wants to change you from the inside out. His Spirit is in there, but does He have full control of every part of your life? And as you yield that control to the Holy Spirit, the, the power of the Holy Spirit will begin to transform you from the inside out and begin to change the way you think, change the way you make decisions. Um, there's a big difference between the carnal Christian that faces struggles, and when they get really in a, in a big jam, they're like, oh, God, help me. You know, they're, they're saved, and they, they know to call out to God when they're, when they're in a problem. But then the Spirit-led Christian starts out with talking to God, and probably isn't going to find themselves getting into some of the jams that the carnal Christian will because they've already started their day with God. They've started their decision with God. They've sought God. They, they begin to think in spiritual terms. They begin to think in spiritual ways. That what's, you know, instead of, um, you know, interacting with this person and just thinking nothing of it, 
Maybe the Lord's opening a door for me to witness to them, thinking of things from God's point of view, rather than thinking, things, thinking of things through the flesh point of view. And that's what Paul says here. And this is the first thing we get to need to get nailed down. As we, as we live out what sanctification is, we need to have ourselves yielded to God, that He can transform our mind. And when we do that, then we will prove or we will demonstrate what the will of God is for our life. So many times we, you know, we struggle with, what is God's will for my life? Yield to God and He'll show you. But if you're busy serving yourself, He can't use you because you're not yielded to Him. You're yielded to yourself. And so as we yield to God, we can begin to see God working in our lives and, ye and de demonstrating what His will is for your life. And He has a will. He has a purpose. He has a list of things He wants you, <clears throat> you specifically to accomplish. There's people that you can reach for Christ that I will never reach, that I never meet. Likewise, I have a circle of friends that you may never interact with. I have my responsibilities, and I, you have your responsibilities, and you have your things that God wants you to do, and I have my things that God wants me to do. It's not my job to judge you and decide, no, oh, you're not doing what God wants you to do. I just need to worry about me. And uh, that's a full-time job. <laughs> So first we need to yield to God. We need to be, uh, have responsibility to yield to God and to um, our responsibility first to God. Secondly, in verse number 3, we see that uh, God's given us some things to help us as we yield to Him and begin to see God's will uh, for our lives unfold. He's given us some gifts to help us in that journey. Uh, verse number 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. <clears throat> For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy <clears throat> according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait, out, wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So God has given us spiritual gifts. Well, what's your gift? Well, the more time you spend with God, you'll start to figure that out. It's not up to, to me or to pastor to go up to you and say, <clears throat> thy gift is. <laughs> now, over time, as you begin to certain, you yield to the Lord and, and devote your life to Him and allow Him to begin to transform your mind and to work His will out in your life, it may become evident, it will, people will be able to see what your gift may be. But let's not get wrapped up on what my gift is. Let's just serve the Lord, and as, as He works in your life, He does have a gift for you. Take comfort in that. He has some way that you, as a member of this body, can be a blessing and effectively minister in a way that other people can't, because we all have different gifts. But yet, we're all part of the same body. Just like my finger's job is very specific and very important, but that job cannot be done by my ear. Does that mean my ear is inferior? No, my ear also has a very specific purpose. And they all work in conjunction, in, in, in concert, together to help me live. Same with you. So we all have different gifts, and that's okay. And the Bible says here, uh, there's something very important. Verse number three, second part there. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now, we all struggle with that because we all have sin nature, and we have pride. And if we're not careful, that'll creep in. Especially as we begin to see God working in our lives, it's very easy for the flesh to sneak in there and go, Wow, look at what I'm doing. No, it's not me. It's Christ in me. I'm, remember, never forget, Christ, uh, Paul said, In me, my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's where we are. And anything good that we do is not because all of a sudden I got better. No, it's because Christ did it in me when I yielded to Him. Never forget that. And when we have that mindset, <clears throat> we can serve one another effectively because 
I'm doing my part, you're doing your part, and we're just leaving all the results up to God. And there's unity. That's what God desires in the church, is unity. Satan, on the other hand, does not want unity because he knows when there's unity, then the church is marching forward for Christ and people are getting saved and lives are being changed and he hates that. So he's always going to try to stick his little bony finger in there and stir your pride and to cause divisions and cause arguments because when the church is not united, then we're not effective in reaching people for Christ, which is our purpose, which is our mission. <coughs> we're to serve one another in, 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 genuinely in love. And verse number 9 makes it very clear. Let love be without dissimulation. That means without hypocrisy or without pretenses. We're just to love one another and to abhor evil and cleave to that which is good. It's pretty simple. We're to serve God with whatever gift He's given to us and we're to not be proud about it and we're to love each other, hate that which is evil, love that which is good, and just get busy and serve the Lord. Then our next responsibility is to other people, mankind. In chapter 12, 9 through 21, um, the Bible goes, there's a long list here, and for time's sake, we won't cover every single one in detail, but simply put, this portion of Scripture, 9 through 12, says we're to be kind, we're to be busy, we're to be hopeful, we're to be patient, we're to be prayerful, we're to be giving, we're to recur we're, we are to return kindness to evil, we're to be empathetic, we're to be lowly in mind. These are all things that we need to be practicing in our lives. If we're going to be set apart for God, these are some of the things, these are our responsibilities to other people. <clears throat> and so, um, easier said than done sometimes. But these, these are the responsibilities that we face uh, before other people. If we're going to say that we love God want to serve God, then we're going to begin to demonstrate these characteristics to other people, whether they're in the church or outside the church. And therein comes the challenge, because people in the church, generally, we don't have a problem demonstrating these, these traits to them. But when someone on the outside curses you up one side and down the other for daring to knock on their door and tell them about Jesus, hmm, bless you, have a good day. <laughs> it's not what I'm thinking, but that's where the challenge comes in. Because if we respond the way the world responds, we respond in the flesh, do we have any impact for Christ in their life? No. It's when we begin to demonstrate live out the responsibilities we have to the lost world that will get their attention. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I just, I just trashed you in your past three generations, but yet you're still smiling and wishing me a good day. Well, you know, I've been pretty mean and nasty and manipulative, but yet somehow you're still patient with me. It begins to catch their attention. It's an, it opens up doors of opportunity where we can minister to them because, again, the end game is, the end goal is to see people get saved. And so this is our responsibility to others around us. And then verse number 17 and 18. Let's take a look at that real quickly. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now I've met some people that really put this to the test. You try, no matter what you do, no matter what you try, to live at peace with them, they find a way to have conflict. There are some people that are just hurting inside. And, and, and again, this is, where the, this is where, you know, if you interact with somebody like that and you're in the flesh, you're, there's going to be a fight. But if we're in the Spirit, we can begin to see things from God's point of view. And, and those kind of people are that way because they have pain and hurt inside. And they need Jesus more than anybody, honestly. And if we're in the flesh, we're not going to minister them the way we should. If we're in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit of the Lord, having a mind transformed, we'll see the pain, we'll see the hurt, and we can get past the fact that they can't live peaceably with anybody, no matter what they do, and still be kind to them and hopefully, prayerfully, win them to Christ. Because over time, it will make a difference. Over time, it will make a difference if we're, again, patient, kind, hopeful, prayerful, returning kindness for evil. All these things that we're, God expects us to do towards our fellow man is part of what it's going to take 
to break through those walls, break through the, the briar patches of sin that they have accumulated in their lives because they're lost and they get into sin and they don't know any better. Uh, some of those people are just trapped in the consequences of their sins and they're miserable and they're angry and they're nasty and they need to see the shining light of Jesus in one of us. They can break through that barrier and hopefully open up the heart long enough for them to hear the gospel and have the Holy Spirit the opportunity to convict their heart and hopefully turn their heart and bring it to Christ. But we've got to get past those defenses. So it's not easy, it's not pleasant, but that's our responsibility as Christians. Then in chapter 13, the first few verses here says we have a responsibility to our government. We have a responsibility to our government. Verse number 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are ordained of God, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinances of God, and they that resist shall receive the, to themselves damnation. So God makes it very clear here. God is, a, God is a God of order. God is a God of structure. And God has ordained the system of government. Not necessarily, I'm not saying that God has His stamp of approval on every individual politician, but the idea of government is God-ordained. God established it. And, and government has a specific purpose that when that government strays from its purpose, God will step in and deal with that government. But we have a responsibility to obey and respect the authority for the simple fact that God ordained it. God set it up. Just like we in our home there's a chain of command. Children not, don't have to always necessarily agree with what mom and dad have said, but there is an authority issue there that they need to obey and yield to for the sake of honoring God who placed that authority in their lives. Same thing on a national scale. God ordained government. We have a government. Is it perfect? No. But is it, is it God ordained? Yes. Should we obey it? As, as much as we can without violating God's law? Yes. So system, ordain, uh, system of government ordained by God, where to obey the government is to obey God. Verse number three. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So the role of government is simply this, to restrain evil and punish evil and to encourage good. That's the purpose of government. Now there's governments around the world that fail miserably at that. But we see over time, usually that goes on for so long and then the people rise up and change that or attempt to change that. Sometimes it ends up being worse than before, unfortunately. Sometimes <clears throat> it works out for the better. That's how America got started. The, the rules and the laws and, and the things that were being done and then the, the, the religious oppression that was being put upon the colonies, we rose up and said enough's enough. And we established a Christian nation. Now, over time, that has slipped. But does that mean we don't pay our taxes and, and uh, just buck our, you know, just go against this? No. We still have a responsibility before God to honor the government so long as it's not forcing us to violate God's laws. If, if they ever pass a law that says you cannot go to church, we would have a responsibility to violate that to still meet together because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. So there's a God law that if man says you can't do that, when the apostles were told by the Sanhedrin, you shall not preach Christ, they, you know, Peter says we cannot help but obey God. <clears throat> and so that's, that's the difference. Um, verses 5 through 7 talks about uh, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, or to custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe oh, no man anything. <clears throat> you know, let's stop right there, verse number seven. Uh, so we have to pay our taxes. We have to pay our, our, you know, whatever it is, customs or our tolls or our taxes. We have a responsibility to, as much as we can, to be a good citizen in the government in which where we are, 
uh, as obedience unto God. And then we have a responsibility to be, live a life of morality. To live a life of morality. Verse number 8. Or verse number 9, I'm sorry. Nope, I was right. Verse number 8. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly com comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we have a responsibility to be a moral person. And as we read that, it sounded a lot like the Ten Commandments, didn't it? And we talked about this earlier. If I'm yielded to the Holy Spirit, if I'm walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, I cannot help but fulfill what the law says a moral person should do. Again, the law was, uh, there's Ten Commandments, but there was a lot of other laws for the nation of Israel. But those Ten Commandments are a universal law that this is God's standard. And none of us can ever keep it. It was given to us to instruct us that we lack the moral ability to be the, lead the standard of life that God expects to have fellowship with Him. It was to teach us. But once we get saved, if, there's God, if they are God's laws, and we have God living our lives, controlling our lives, if we're yielded to God, then we're going to obey God's laws. We're going to be moral, so long as we're yielded to God. We yield to the Spirit, we yield to the flesh, however, we can slip back into that bondage. We willingly put the chains back on and begin to violate God's laws again. Praise God, we're justified in Christ. We don't lose our salvation, but we can lose our fellowship. And that's why it's important we maintain a life of morality. Verse number 11. And that knowing the time that now is, it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Another reason why we need to live a moral life is Jesus could come back at any moment. The rapture is imminent. We don't know when. But I can promise you this. When we started Sunday school to now... We're that much closer to when Jesus could come back. That being the reality, ought we, ought, we ought to be careful that we do things that are right with God, lest He come and catch us doing something that would bring shame to Him. When I give my kids a job to do, and I give them a deadline... They'll usually wait until the last five minutes before the deadline and then <laughs> hurry to get everything done. But there's other times where I've given them tasks to do and I don't tell them when I'm going to check. Usually that task gets done earlier. Why? Because they don't know when I'm going to check. And same reality. God wants us to understand that He could come back at any time and that reality, that knowledge, should be a motivation to us to live a life that is right with God Every, every moment that we have because we don't know when it could be our last moment. And so that, that motivates us to do what we ought to do. <clears throat> to do what is right before God. And again, he, Paul says here, not only live a life that is right, but throw off those works of darkness. We, we, we can't afford to be spending time messing with that junk because Jesus could come back. And am I doing the things that Jesus wanted me to do? It's, it would be a great thing to be caught doing something good. It would be a great, great moment in our lives to be busy doing something and all of a sudden we find ourselves in heaven. Woo. And know that the last thing I did on earth was bringing a smile to Jesus' face rather than a frown. In verse number 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering in wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So as, as we wrap up this chapter here, Paul again uh, iterates the reality that we need to put on Christ. That, that's again talking about the choice of yielding to Christ, yielding to the Spirit, putting on Christ, putting off the old man, and in so doing... We also need to take, take this into account. 
We're to put on Christ, but we're also, as we begin to think with God's mind, as God transforms our mind, we begin to think ahead. The flesh is always whatever's in the moment. Just do what feels good. Whatever you feel, do it now. Don't think about it. Don't care about the consequences. Just do it. That's the flesh. As we begin to be transformed in our mind, we're going to begin to think differently and think, hmm, I know that when I go to this place, I am always tempted and I usually screw up and give in a temptation. I'm going to plan ahead and I'm going to purpose in my heart not to be in that place. Paul says, don't make provision for the flesh. We're not, we're not ever going to be free from the temptation of this flesh that we have. But we don't have to set ourselves up for failure either. If I know that when I hang out with a certain friend, I end up doing things that I'm ashamed of later or that I have regrets for, maybe you shouldn't spend that much time with that friend. These are some of the decisions that we begin to make as God transforms our mind and we begin to plan ahead for success and knowing that there's weaknesses in my life and I know that those weaknesses are there and I'm praying that God would strengthen me, but while I'm waiting for God to work on my life, I'm going to make sure that I don't make opportunity for myself to give in to that temptation. I'm going to do everything that I can do to avoid setting myself up for failure as I let God work in my life. And, and Lord willing, over time, that temptation may diminish, that may weaken. We talked about that where Paul says, the, the longer you walk with God, the, the power of sin has a diminishing effect. There's diminishing power the longer we walk with Christ. Those temptations that were huge and strong, the, it does weaken over time, but we need to be faithful and consistent in yielding to God for that to happen. Our next responsibility, responsibility is found in chapter 14, uh, running into 15 a little bit, and that is we have a responsibility to our weaker brethren. Other Christians who may not have been saved as long or may, may have been saved out of different circumstances than us that, that brings into their life certain ways of thinking in their mind on how to put it. They may struggle with certain things that you don't. Or they may view something as wrong that you don't. And this is, a, this is an interesting area because we have liberty in Christ. We are free from sin and we have liberty. And there are certain areas where God has not said this is absolutely sin. Now, those things are obvious and we should, none of us should have anything to do with those. There's no argument there. And there, God has also said there's other things that these are absolutely right. There's no, there's no need for a conference about it. These things are right. Those things are wrong. Oh, if life was just black and white. But there's gray areas. What about those gray areas? This is what Paul's going to deal with here. Chapter 14, verse number 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubting disputations. Putations. So Paul starts it off right from the get-go. Don't get into arguments. We're not to argue with one another. Again, the goal is unity. The goal is unity. Is everybody going to have the same exact level of faith as you? No. There are some people that have been saved a week that have stronger faith than people who have been saved five years. Everyone's different. Everyone comes from different backgrounds. Everyone has different levels of baggage that they've, they've been delivered from. And there's, there's lasting effects of that as the Lord begins to transform you. We're all coming from different backgrounds where we have different challenges and things that we struggle with as God's working in our lives. So we need to be careful that we don't offend another Christian who may have a faith that is weaker than yours. And that does not mean that they're less of a Christian just because they have a weaker faith. Remember, we're equal. We're on equal footing with Christ. We all have the same standing. But we're all different. Verses 2 through 11 deals with uh, you know, things like, uh, I, I've, I believe it's a sin to eat this. Well, this Christian over here says, I have no problem with that, eating that whatsoever at all. Other people, well, I think this day is a very special day and we ought to honor it. And this person over here says, I think that day is just like any other day and it's not a big deal. From personal experience, I can tell you there can be huge fights and even church division over whether or not you regard a day as a special day or not a special day. It seems ridiculous, but it happens. It happens. 
Let's take a look real quickly here. It says, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, and esteemeth every day the like. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And so here's what God's trying to get across to us is, if I regard a certain day as a special day, and I'm doing it out of sincerity to the Lord, fine. If, on the other hand, this person over here, because of where they're at and their faith, they think, well, that, that is, I don't, see that, I don't see how that could be right to honor that day. I, I don't think it's right. I think it's disrespectful to the Lord. And they are doing that out of a sincere heart, trying to honor the Lord. That's fine, too. You don't have to agree on things that are not black or white. Because their level of faith may be different than yours. They may be having gone through experiences you didn't experience. And if they're doing it out of a true, sincere heart to the Lord, and it's different than your point of view, leave it alone. Don't argue about it. You don't always have to be right. Just let it go. Because I'm not their judge. And you're not my judge. And we're all very happy for that. As long as I am seeking to honor the Lord out of a sincere heart, it's going to be okay. Now, over time, maybe his point of view or their point of view will change to be closer to mine. Or maybe I might discover that over time, my point of view will change and be more like theirs. But that's God's business. That's God's working in my life and your life. Let's hate evil, love good, the areas where we don't exactly agree, but it's not sin and it's not, you know, thus saith the Lord, let's just not worry about that because we've got people to get saved. And I've got my own problems I need to let the Lord work on. So I, I have a full-time job begging God to change me. I should not have time to judge you. And likewise, back at us, back at me. It's gonna, there's going to be differences. Verse number 14 I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably? Destroy him not with thy meat, for whom Christ died. One of the issues that was going on was uh, the pagans would offer up a sacrifice to their false gods. And it was the best meat available. Well, after the sacrifice is done, they would sell it in the market at a discounted price. So you had some believers that are saying, whew, you know, they were obviously Baptists. Whew, I got a deal. <laughs> we're going to have steak tonight. But other Christians were going, whoa, brother, that was offered to a false god. That's offensive to me. Paul says, the reality is, there was nothing wrong with that meat, no matter what it was done, what, what, no matter who what its purpose was. Because as a Christian, I know there is no other God but God. So they were just laying a piece of meat in front of a statue. Okay, I can throw some barbecue sauce on that and eat it. <laughs> but, is my liberty so important that I would cause a brother to stumble? That's wrong. Now I was thinking, how, how, can, I put a, how can I bring in a modern day illustration in here to, to try to uh, us, help us understand. So, <clears throat> Sam here does not believe that it's right to go shopping on a Sunday. Not really, but this is my illustration. <laughs> so, Sam does not believe it's right to go shopping on a Sunday. I have no problem with it. He needs a ride home, and I need to get some milk. Do I go to the store before or after I drop off Sam? After. If I'm going to be a responsible Christian... And a loving Christian, I'm going to drop off Sam first and then go get my milk. Rather than being like some Christians who say, I have freedom, brother, and I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm going to go get the milk and show you that the lightning of God does not come down and strike me. And you're obviously wrong. I need to get right with God. That's where division starts. That's where arguments start. And the only one that wins is Satan. So let's be wise about the liberty we have in those areas in life that are not clearly sin and not clearly right, but 
a matter of judgment. If you have a difference then with another brother, make sure you don't offend them in your liberty. You have the liberty, but there's a bigger purpose. The unity of this church, peace with, remember, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I must do, I have a responsibility that I can do everything I possibly can do to avoid a misunderstanding, to avoid an argument, to avoid offending or hurting or wounding another brother or sister in Christ that would cause their walk with Christ to suffer just because I enjoy liberty. That's wrong. That's prideful. That's selfish. And it's sinful. And the devil loves it. Verses, uh, verse number chapter number 15 <clears throat> or verse, actually verse number 22 of 14, sorry. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that, doubleth, he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So we go back to the illustration of, of um, you know, me and Sam in the car. And, and I might say, well, I might ask. I say, hey, would it be okay if I stopped and get milk? Now deep down inside... It's not okay with him. But he doesn't want to offend me. So he says, yeah, okay. We can stop and get milk. I just caused him to sin because the Bible makes it clear. If he believes that is not right and he's trying to honor God in that, that belief, if I coerce him to do it, he has sinned. And I was part of it. If I believe that it's okay to go to a store and buy milk... And somebody were to convince me that no, you shouldn't, and I yield just to kind of make them happy, even though deep down inside I still feel there's nothing wrong, there's no problem with it. I've sinned. And we need to be careful that we don't push our preferences on other people and cause them to stumble in sin. It's okay to be different in certain areas. And, and we can still love Jesus, and we can still win souls, and not agree in every minutia of every preference in our lives. We go on to chapter 15, verse number 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the rep reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. So we have Christ the example. He didn't need to die on a cross. He had no issues. He had no need but he went to the cross because we had a need that, that needed to be met. In, in the same way, those of us that have, a person that has a stronger faith and doesn't struggle with certain things, but a, per, a brother or sister in Christ that has a weaker faith, those that have the stronger faith should go above and beyond the call of duty to, to help let them grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and let the Lord work in their lives and not make a big deal out of it, not, not throw, you know, throw ourselves down as you know, looking down upon them because we think we're somehow better because our faith is, is in a different place than theirs at this time. We, uh, who are you know, those who have a stronger faith, need to help those with the younger faith and not hurt them and not harm them in their journey and in their walk with the Lord. Just like J Jesus Christ lowered himself to meet our need. That's the ultimate example. I will do whatever it takes to help you grow as a Christian. That's a sign of a mature Christian, that they will be willing to do whatever it takes to help a younger Christian or a Christian with a younger faith, uh, weaker faith to see their faith strengthened in the Lord, to help them grow and develop and blossom as a Christian. That is true love as a fellow Christian, is to, to nurture that and encourage that and help them Verse number seven, uh, verse number five through seven of chapter fifteen. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a goal that we can walk side by side, shoulder to shoulder, serving the Lord and glorifying the Lord before a lost and dying world. Because there's all sorts of squabbling and fights. I mean, good grief! Look at the headlines. Nobody can get along anymore. But if, they, if, a, if a person comes in here and sees us who have different points of view and have different backgrounds and, and 
yet we're still with one purpose and with one mind, proclaiming, glorifying Christ, that's going to make a difference. We're going to shine as a light in a dark world when we can do that. Verse number 13 reminds us of where we get the power to do that. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. It keeps coming back to this one theme. Yield to the Holy Spirit who is in you. Yield to His power. Yield to His wisdom. And these things will begin to change in each and every one of our lives. All for the better. All for the better. And all for the glory of Jesus Christ who deserves it all because he did it all for us. Verse number 14, our next responsibility is to our leader or our pastor. Verse number 14, Paul here is sharing with the, the church of Rome. He says, And I myself, am all, am, uh, I myself also am persuaded of, persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to uh, admonish one another. So he's, he's praising them. He's encouraging them. Keep doing what you're doing. You guys are doing a great job. He, he's sharing his heart with them. Verses 15 through 21, Paul shares his desire to, um, his, his ministry to the Gentiles and his passion for reaching the, the Gentiles and the, and the, the non-Jewish people for, for Christ. And then in chapter, uh, verse number 22 through 29, Paul shares his desires also that he wants to be able to go to Spain and minister in Spain and to uh, deliver gifts to Jerusalem that was given to them by Macedonia to minister to the, the poor Christians there in, in Jerusalem. And then lastly, he also expresses his desire to come to Rome and, and be with those people in Rome as well. And so he's sharing his heart. He's sharing his passion. He's sharing what God is wanting to do through him. And we need to listen to our pastor and listen to his passion, listen to what God's leading is for, and, and to embrace that and to come alongside him and help him accomplish that. We need to be sensitive to uh, see how God is leading our pastor and to do everything we can to support and encourage him as he follows the Lord's leading. And then lastly, and most importantly, verse number 30, we are to pray for our pastor. Now I beseech you, verse number 30, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of, Spirit, the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted in, of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Your pastor has a huge target on him and his family. And the enemy hates him. And the enemy knows the best way he can hurt this church is to take down our pastor or his family. And we need to be praying for him daily. We need to be on our knees begging God to protect him, to help him, to encourage him, to give him the wisdom and the, and the purpose that he has that he, in need of to lead us as a church. Because there's... A, there's an enemy out there that absolutely hates him and his family, and we need to pray for him. Now, God is God, is God but we need to pray and, and ask God to put a hedge of protection around our pastor's family and to give pastor the wisdom and the, and the courage that he needs to lead us, because it's not easy leading us, because we're a bunch of flawed, sinful people that have our own struggles each and every day, and it's a challenge for a pastor to lead this many different people in following a common purpose. It's a challenge. I pastored for five years. I love preaching. I tell you, the hard part was pastoring. Preaching comes easy. I love it. I enjoy it. Pastoring? <laughs> that was a job. <laughs> that was a job and a half. And it's not easy. So we need to pray for him. And then lastly, chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Uh, I command you unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is, the, at, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. For she hath been a succor, uh, or that word means helper, of many and of myself also. Um, 
And some of you may have a footnote at the end of the, chapter, uh, end of the book of Romans, but Phoebe was the one that Paul gave the letter of, uh, of the book of Romans to to take it to the church at Rome. She was the one that couriered it and delivered it to the church at Rome. And then as we look down here, chapter uh, verses 3 through 16, um, there's a lot of different names mentioned, but the bottom line is Christian fellowship and encouragement is, Paul says this is, this is an important thing. We need to have Christian fellowship. We need to encourage each other. We need to um, pray for one another uh, that we would all, in our journey that we have, you know, we're not being judgmental, but we see, you know, somebody might share, hey, I'm really struggling in this area. Instead of judging them, pray for them. Have Christian fellowship. You know, you know send them a text. Hey, I was thinking of you. Prayed for you. Hope you're doing great. You know, let's encourage each other. Let's build each other up to serve the Lord together. Uh, and that's what Paul taught. As he lists all these different people in verses 3 through 16, he's encouraging Christian fellowship. And then verses 17 through 20, let's look at that real quickly. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ by their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. For your, your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. I once had somebody tell me that, well, you can't effectively teach on that because you don't know anything about that. Well, the Bible says here I'm to be simple concerning evil. I don't have to go to experience every deep, dark secret of a certain sin to be able to then, by the authority of God, preach on it. No, quite the opposite. I'm to be ignorant to the things of sin and knowledgeable to the things of God. The world might say, well, you're naive. Praise Jesus. I'd rather be naive about evil than fully experienced because there's a lot of scars and a lot of heartaches and other people's lives that are damaged by my knowledge of, of sin. I'd rather be ignorant of sin and knowledgeable of good. And then um, verse number 22, I, Tertius, wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. As we're going to see, as we, this is the first book of uh, Paul that was written. As you're going to see, quite often he would dictate to someone else and someone else would actually write down the words. God inspired Paul and Paul dictated and someone else would pen the letter that he was having written and then he would give it to somebody and they would, they would deliver it to the intended audience. And then the last exhortation we find in verse number 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So Paul just touches on the fact that the, the idea of the church had been kept a mystery through the Old Testament. There was different prophecies that, that alluded to it, but that um, it was really a mystery. But now that mystery has been revealed. And as he wrote this letter to the church at Rome, he's saying it's now being revealed and it's fulfilling its purpose, which is to evangelize the world. We're out of time. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank